we will be uh, starting our program uh, shortly. Uh, I uh, would like to uh, introduce uh, Nancy Nesbitt, the head curator for the Palestine Museum. Uh, she would like to say a word before we get started. Nancy? Yes, thank you. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, not unfortunately having met Raji Cook, I'm honored to be part of the memorial today to this artist who invented a common language understandable to all the world's citizens, in effect, uniting us in understanding. I turn now to Faisal Saleh. Thank you, Nancy. Uh, I would like to uh, welcome all uh, members of uh, Raji's family. Um, we will uh, go through a, a formal program today uh, that will last about an hour. Uh, at the end of that hour, uh, we will uh, give people opportunity to become, uh, to join the panel and speak uh, if they would like to. Without further ado, uh, I'm Faisal Sala. I'm the founder and the executive director of the Palestine Museum US. Um, I am a friend of Raji and uh, a big admirer of him and his work and his dedication to the Palestinian cause. Um, the painting you see behind me uh, is a painting that the museum commissioned uh, several months ago, and it was painted uh, by the Palestinian artist who lives in Luxembourg, uh, <clears throat> Jacqueline uh, Bajani. Jacqueline has painted about uh, 20 uh, Palestinian portraits. These are portraits of important Palestinians. And I had the opportunity to uh, nominate four Palestinians to be added to the list. And Raji was one of the first I nominated. Uh, so thanks to uh, Jacqueline uh, for her work. Uh, and uh, this portrait uh, will be exhibited at the Palestine Museum uh, as part of the permanent collection. So uh, our first order of the day, uh, we will uh, have uh, a Palestinian uh, artist, a uh, musician uh, who lives in uh, the area between Haifa and Akka in uh, occupied Palestine. Uh, we have uh, a recording of uh, her song, Amazing Grace, that we will be playing uh, in English. And it has some Arabic lyrics towards the end of the song. Please stand by for that. blind but now 
Our thanks to uh, Amal Morcos and uh, Fadi Deeb who, uh, who played the piano. Um, next, uh, we are hoping to have a reading of um, Raj's obituary by his granddaughter, uh, Sarah Roden Lechtenberg. And I'm still uh, waiting for her to join uh, the, uh, the event here. Um, and uh, so far, I can't see her. Uh, Sarah and I share the same alma mater. Uh, we both attended the George School in Newtown, Pennsylvania. Hi, um, I'm Sarah Rodin. Um, this is my husband, uh, Tyler Lechtenberg, and our son, Solomon Raji, who uh, was named after uh, Raji, who we're all gathered here to honor today. Um, so, um, I'm going to read some excerpts from his obituary that um, we wrote last week. Um, and um, I hope that for those of you who didn't know Raji personally, um, that you give you a little bit of insight into kind of, you know, who he was as a person and as a grandfather and as a parent and, you know, just an all around great person. Yeah. Um, Okay, so Raji, Roger Cook was born, uh, Washington Crossing, Pennsylvania, passed away peacefully on Saturday, February 6th, 2001, in the presence of his daughters and the love of his life, Peggy. Pioneer graphic designer, Middle East peace activist, and beloved husband, father, grandfather, great-grandfather, brother, and friend, Raji left a meaningful and lasting imprint on all those who were lucky enough to know him. In Arabic, Raji means hope, a fitting name because through so many of us, Raji was not simply family, an artist, or a neighbor. He was a singularly generous and buoyant force whose brilliance and talent were matched only by his kindness and good humor, whose remarkable professional legacy was exceeded only by his life-sustaining love for his family and his unwavering commitment to peace and justice for the Palestinian people. Born in Newark, New Jersey on July 6, 1930 to Palestinian immigrants Najib and Jalili Cook, Raji graduated from Bloomfield High School and the Pratt Institute in Brooklyn, and he served our nation in the New Jersey National Guard from 1946 to 1955. Um, Raji worked in a number of different prestigious graphic design and advertising firms before founding his own firm, Cook and Chinoski Association, Associates, um, Inc. in 1967. Um, he did many you know, incredibly important um, projects throughout his career. But of course, his most famous is the symbol signs. Um, no matter where you are or where you live, if you've been to an airport or looked for a public restroom, you are most certainly familiar with his work. In 1974, Cook and Chinoski was selected by the American Institute of Graphic Arts and the US Department of Transportation to design symbol signs a collection of 52 pictograms, including the internationally recognizable men's and women's bathroom signs, the no smoking sign and parking sign, and many, many more, which are used to this day. He often joked because as, for those of you who know him, he was a very funny person. Um, his art appeared in more museums than Matisse and Van Gogh's. For his contribution, he was invited to the White House in 1985 to receive a presidential award for design excellence. In 2003, the project was accepted to the collections of Cooper Hewitt, the National Design Museum, and the Smithsonian Institution. Um, Raji closed his Cook, closed Cook and Chinoski in 2002, um, and he turned his attention to a project he had been working on since 1981, um, a very prolific career as an artist activist. He created and exhibited three-dimensional sculptural assemblages, his quote boxes, 
including many about the Middle East conflict and the Palestinian humanitarian crisis. His art was informed by his life story and his many fact-finding trips to Jordan, the West Bank, Gaza, Israel, and Egypt and Syria. He was serving on the task force for the Middle East, a group sponsored by the Presbyterian Church of the United States. The drive for a peaceful resolution to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict became his life's mission. And the focus of his art and activism and his boxes were featured in galleries across the United States and around the world. A man of seemingly limitless energy, compassion and concern for human rights, it was not uncommon to see Raji in his 70s and 80s engaged in deep conversation and debate with inquiring 20-somethings at his art openings and activism events in Brooklyn, Washington, or Philadelphia. And in 2018, after years of commitment, Raji published his memoir, A Vision for My Father, The Life and Work of Palestinian American Artist and Designer Raji Cook, with Interlink Publishing Group. His distinguished professional career was of course, just part of his story. Raji met his wife of 50, 65 years, Margaret Peggy Schneider in 1944. She was, as he wrote, a woman of intelligence and integrity, the kind of life companion who would explore this path I wanted to follow with me. Raji and Peggy devoted their lives to their love of modern design. In 1969, they moved with their daughters, Cynthia and Kathy, Catherine to a Bauhaus inspired glass and stone home they built in the woods of Washington Crossing, PA. Visitors to their home would quickly notice the hundreds of antique potato mashers lining the walls, an expression of Raji's passion for simple yet perfect design. If you visited the home as, as a child, or let's face it, at any time in your life, you would gaze in awe at the extensive model train he'd set up over the holidays. You'd crack up at Sparky, the rambunctious raccoon hand puppet Raji summoned whenever children were near. You might even witness an after dinner magic show and find Raji had somehow taken your nose off your face. Uh, as a side note with Sparky, I remember very clearly being a teenager traveling with Raji around Jordan um, and him bringing it out to um, entertain um, young children everywhere we went. And it was his way of kind of getting people to talk to him and enjoy him. He was really someone who um, liked for people to enjoy him when he was around and, um, and he was very easy to enjoy. So it was great. Um, perhaps you were present when he pulled out his guitar and sang bluegrass or country Western songs with a professional tang, twang. After dinner, maybe you meandered down to the basement and watched a slideshow of adventures with Peggy in Spain, Greece, Estonia, Prague, Venezuela, or other foreign lands. Likely you accompanied him on a tour of the studio he built in his backyard, a museum of thousands of found objects with a giant handmade paper mache pencil, a manifestation of his unique genius. The home and studio were, the, were an embodiment of Raji, a tribute to his curiosity, creativity, love, and above all, his namesake, Hope. Um, in the obituary, I went on to talk about um, a number of um, organizations that Raji's um, involved, was involved in in his life. Um, and I wanted to note among them that he was a great supporter of the Palestinian Christian Re uh, Children's Relief Fund, the Ramallah Friends School and uh, uh, George School. Um, and he also mentored and encouraged many students interested in pursuing careers in the visual arts. I think one thing that Raji often talked about was how he was a, a young person his, his father was nervous about him going into the arts. Um, he assumed that his son would become a lawyer or a banker or something like that. Um, and it you know, was a, a real feeling of accomplishment um, and a real, um, he saw as kind of like a gift to his father to um, have become so successful in, in the field of the arts. So um, he loved mentoring young people, especially Palestinian young people who were interested in going into art. Um, I think many of his family are here today, um, and I just wanted to note, um, in addition to his wife Peggy, he's survived by his daughters, Cynthia um, and Ka Cynthia, Cynthia Rodine, her husband William, his daughter Catherine Cook, her grandchildren, um, his grandchildren Sarah, Torn and Amy Rodine, his grandson-in-law Tiger, Tyler Lechtenberg, and um, Dolly Raji Lechtenberg, who's here also. Um, he's also survived by his sister Lillian, um, his brother Wade and his wife Pat, his brother Edward and his wife Betsy, um, 
And I'll note that his sister, Julia um, James, passed away in 2008. Um, so that's, that's the obituary. Um, I, it's online, so you can read it with more um, detail in it. It's very long already, but um, thank you all for um, joining us um, today to um, honor um, someone who was incredibly important in um, the life, my life, my family's life, my son's life, or, um, and for his many friends. Um, uh, we're really grateful that you are holding this event for us. Thank you, Sarah. Um, next, uh, I will play to you uh, a, a 35 minute video uh, that I have recorded uh, an, as an interview um, with Raji uh, a little over a year ago. Um, the video was never published and uh, this is the first time it will be uh, shared with people. Uh, normally, uh, a video like that, we edit down to about five or seven minutes. However, uh, I, I tried uh, and agonized every, over every minute of the video. I could only bring it down to 34 and a half minutes or, or so. Um, uh, the video is really um, touching, um, very emotional. Um, Raji was very sharp. Um, and he was, uh, to the point, uh, very passionate uh, about his art and his work as, as he discussed it with me in the video. Uh, I edited out my questions to shorten the video so you'd only hear Raji talking and some of what he's saying, uh, if it comes abruptly, it's as a response to a question that I took out. Here we go. As an artist with pa Palestinian heritage, I would like to. Uh, <laughs> I'm I'm eighty I'm eighty eight now. I'll be eighty nine in in July. I'm thinking about you know, <laughs> there's going to have to be an obituary about me. Um, what what would it say? What would I want it to say? Well, I wanted to say that, that I worked real hard trying to give a voice for a people without a voice and doing that through my art, a peaceful way of expressing what's really happening in the Middle East. <laughs> My name is Raji Cook. I'm a Palestinian American. Now, Cook sounds non Palestinian, but my family name was actually Suleiman. And the, uh, when the British came in and took over the territory from the Turks, who called my grandfather Kujuk, my grandfather was a small man. And uh, Kujuk means small, I believe, in, uh, in Turkish. But when the British came and ex sort of expelled, you might say, the, uh, the Turks, they confronted my grandfather and asked him, what's your name? And he said, Kujuk. They said, no, that's a bad name. That's Turkish. Your name is Cook. Well, my family name was originally Suleiman. So my name, my family name, was taken away from us. My mom and dad came from Ramallah in 1927. My, my dad made a, several trips back and forth from America to Ramallah, but on one of them married my mom. Her name was Jalila. Her last name was Tota, Jalila Tota. Um, the, after they, they married, they came to America in the year 1927. Shortly afterwards, I was born in 1930. And subsequently, my parents had uh, uh, another daughter and then a son, another daughter, and another son. When I was in high school, 
my junior year, 1946, 47, um, my dad asked me, what did I want to do with my life? And you know, and most Palestinians and most immigrants, they come to America thinking that their offsprings will end up being in the medical field or law or uh, engineering, something that would guarantee food on the table. And being uh, uh, a, uh, a person who was born in 1930, a year after the 29 crash, my dad was really concerned and uh, that I would have had been able to provide food on the table for my family when I would subsequently be married. Well, I was really interested in art and I told him I wanted to go to art school. Going to art school was not uh, uh, in my dad's vocabulary. Really, uh, he didn't know too much about what that area of, of uh, a career, you might say, uh, would give his son, uh, and especially, as I said, during the, uh, the uh, Depression in 1929, how is he going to provide food if being an artist? How could he make a living being an artist? Well, my dad did subsequently decide he was going to support me in whatever I did. He lived long enough to realize that his decision was a good one. I graduated uh, college in 1954. I worked for a large advertising agency in Philadelphia, the first advertising agency in the United States. Then I was offered a job in, uh, on Madison Avenue in New York with a design firm. I subsequently, uh, after five years, decided to leave and start my own business. I had a wonderful career. My dad lived long enough to see me shake the hands of Ronald Reagan, the President of the United States. After we completed a project for the United States government and winning an award for it, a design award, only one of 13 awards given for design in America. The project, it was to design a set of symbols that would assist travelers coming to America at that time approaching the bicentennial. And they were concerned, the government was concerned, that people would be able to travel freely without having uh, uh, a language they may not be totally familiar with. So these symbols was going to be a visual language a uh, ticket counter, baggage, ground transportation, arrivals, departures, um, luggage pickup. These are symbols that are pretty important. Men's room and ladies' room, most important. And uh, um, these symbols would have to be understood clearly uh, as a graphic image to foreigners who have no understanding of the English language. The project took us a year to do. We did about 70 symbols. As I might have indicated earlier, but I had a partner uh, that worked with me for about 30 years. This project took a full year to do. And uh, uh, it was exciting to be a, a son of an immigrant uh, developing a project that people all over the world would be using. And this started in 1974 when it was introduced to an inter international uh, conference on transportation. That's a long time ago. My father really lived long enough to uh, see that uh, my career and his uh, willingness to uh, provide an education for me was a good investment. As a designer, graphic designer, I really never thought I was working. 
I was I was doing work for AT and T, IBM, uh, uh, sharing for many pharmaceutical companies. Um, uh, all all of my clients were Fortune 500. Uh, we had no uh, sales staff. I uh, I was a salesman. I was a designer, and I had a partner who also assisted in design. I mentioned earlier, his name was Don Shinovsky. In 1981, my wife and I decided we would like to go to Palestine. I would be interested in uh, seeing a little bit and understanding and getting to know more about my roots. And uh, uh, we spent a month in the Middle East. Went to Egypt and uh, Jordan and Palestine. On a subsequent trip that I, I was part of for the United Presbyterian Church in 1981 or 82, um, the Presbyterian Church General Assembly decided that it would be important for all the Presbyterian churches in America to have a better understanding of what was going on in the Middle East. We uh, went to Palestine. It was an eye-opening experience for me, especially the visit to Gaza. It was the only time in my adult years that I could remember breaking down. I was totally, totally, my life was totally impacted by the visit to Gaza, visiting refugee camps, visiting the people in those camps, seeing what was happening. I could not believe, I could not understand how a situation that was happening there could happen. Uh, I came from America. I had the freedom to do anything, most anything I wanted to do that was a law-abiding person would do. I could travel, I could, I could uh, say things that I would like to say, but uh, uh, so many things that I found in, uh, in Gaza and subsequently when we went to uh, the, the West Bank, which was called Palestine at one time, um, I found out there were things such as home demolitions, unequal distribution of water, collective punishment, uh, so many things that were so, uh, so difficult to understand that I never had to cope with. In that visit in Gaza, I actually broke down. I called my wife and I tried to explain what was happening. I called my partner. I, I was emotionally torn uh, talking to both my wife and my partner, my business partner. Getting back, leaving Gaza, we had a bus that took us there. And it was just, it was parked outside of Gaza, uh, just at the Gaza border. As I was getting on the bus, I was trying to figure out what could I do? What could I do as an artist? What could I do as a human being to share, help me share my experiences and, and, and perhaps make a difference to the people that I, was, uh, that I visited with in Gaza and the West Bank. How could I do something that might alleviate what I saw, the problem? Riding in the bus, I said, well, you're an artist. Why don't you do artwork? Well, I spent my uh, productive years working for major clients, uh, doing collateral material, annual reports, brochures, films. But is there a way that I could apply some of this experience to create an awareness to people in America and perhaps beyond about what I saw, what I experienced with my own eyes? I was really impressed by the work of an American artist by the name of Joseph Cornell. He was uneducated in the field of art, but for somehow 
he ended up in doing throughout his life creating uh, boxes and he would go to flea markets and uh, and uh, basically flea markets and he would buy objects and he would build a box out of wood and uh, put these uh, objects that he would find to express his feelings about various things. And, and being uh, impressed by that, I said, you know, I could do that. I was always handy with woodworking. And uh, I said, I could make boxes. I could, uh, uh, I could express myself in a creative manner about what I've seen and what I've heard. I started doing that. I ended up uh, making about 80 boxes or more and exhibiting them at various shows. I had no problem exhibiting, but not exhibiting them in major uh, museums or galleries. Mostly museums were afraid to show the work because they couldn't understand how, I'm sure, that this sort of thing could be happening or perhaps under pressure from uh, Jewish groups that didn't want people to understand uh, what, what, I was, what was happening there that I was trying to express through my art. There's several projects that I did to be able to express my, my feelings. So often you, we hear in America that, that uh, Israelis have been uh, uh, attacked, uh, have been, been uh, shot, or, or what, um, that, that the Palestinians, the, the thing that bothered me most, that Palestinians were sort of inhuman. They're vicious people. We, only, we always heard about one side of the issue here in America. Today, this is still going on. To this day, as I speak, we're only hearing one side of what's happening in the Middle East. We never hear, or very, 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 very little do we hear about what is really happening in the West Bank, in Palestine with illegal settlements and so a uh, uh, killing of Palestinian children. We only hear of the tragic situation of a child being killed that was a, a Jewish or some young fanatical Palestinian uh, went and blew his, uh, himself up in a, in a market. But I, I tried to figure out, I tried to express myself through my art, that uh, the Palestinians had no airplanes, they had no fighter planes, they had no uh, tanks, they had no nothing more than, in most cases, a slingshot. Whereas the the uh, military in Israel had uh, uh, fighter planes, perhaps provided by the American government. They had tanks. These are things that I saw. Uh, airplanes that have the Star of David on it. Uh, tanks uh, going through Palestinian villages. Um, I wanted to express some of these things. So maybe more clearly, being what's happening could, could be more clear to uh, uh, what, what's going on there. And uh, doing work for major corporations in America, um, creating uh, uh, programs or developing um, brochures or film um, was very easy for me to help promote what a client was looking for or trying to do. Well, I said I could do that. And when I was doing it, I felt very comfortable. I had no problem of expressing myself. 
My only problem is getting my work exhibited. Um, um, my, I had a great deal of experience. I, I was a student, uh, given a, an award for a, a student who graduated Pratt Institute as being an outstanding designer in my field. I, uh, I uh, felt very good to, to be a Palestinian and doing what I'm doing now um, uh, as clients being my heritage. Relatives who are still there. One of the projects that I did was uh, I got the names of all the children that were killed, Palestinian and Israeli children that were killed within a period of 10 years. And um, the overwhelming names, uh, well, let me tell you a little bit about the project. I created a box, and the box had a list of names, both Jewish names, Israeli names, and Palestinian children's names. And in the bottom of the bottom quarter of the box was filled with spent cartridges, bullets, but spent cartridges of the kind of weapons that were used by the Israelis in the Middle East. The overwhelming names in this box, just a list, nothing more graphic than names and cartridges, but the overwhelming names by far were Palestinian children. Very few of the names were Israelis. Its children are dying, and the majority of them are Palestinians. There was a book, a publication put out not too long ago by the Washington Report on Middle Eastern Affairs, I believe. And it, uh, it listed for a given year the amount of deaths, children being killed on both sides. This publication is readily available, and it takes day by day, every day and every month, how many children were killed and their names. But it's unbelievable. Overwhelmingly, more than 60 or 70 percent of their names were Palestinian children, young children, never having an opportunity to live as I am living in my home. I'm a collector. I collect a lot of things. And one day I was at a flea market in uh, just outside of Lambertville, Pennsylvania, very large flea market. And uh, I found something there that, that really uh, I knew right away what I wanted to do with it. Usually I buy it, I get something at the flea market. I'm not sure, but it looks kind of interesting. And perhaps I could use it in one of my boxes. But uh, I found an ammo box. And ammo boxes, uh, they come in different sizes. And uh, what they are is uh, it, it would carry, these are American boxes. They would have ammunition like uh, uh, for various size uh, weapons, and uh, uh, they would take belts. The, the ammunition is not just loose. They're in a belt that would be fed into some sort of a, a machine gun. And uh, it was khaki in color, and on the side, it gave the, uh, the uh, information on what was in the box, what caliber ammunition. I said, gee, that's interesting. and. Uh, I took it home. I bought one. I now have two or three more. Um, but uh, I took it home and I said, Gee, how can I help? What can help me in making uh, this thing express something that I want to say? The Palestinians 
are always being told that they're, they're using slingshots. Did anybody ever think a slingshot against a tank, a uh, 50 caliber machine gun, an airplane, where Palestinians are using rocks, throwing rocks, using slingshots. There are no calibers in slingshot. A slingshot is a slingshot. And it, it's, a, it's a rubber band, you might say, with a little pocket for a rock. Um, and I said, gee, I could, I could put rocks in that box that might express this is what the, uh, this is what the Palestinian are using to defend themselves. The, 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 besides the, the rocks, we hear of suicide bombers. Can you imagine why would a person in, in their right mind uh, blow themselves up? Well, you know, people don't realize that. They don't think about the fact that they're using their body. It's, the situation is so depressing. They had no weapons. They have no airplanes. They have no tanks. They have no bazookas of where they're fighting a country that they're, they're being uh, colonized and attacked and, and, uh, and uh, shot at with, by airplanes and tanks and, and high caliber, sophisticated guns. Uh, and the Palestinians are using their bodies. I, I just wonder if anybody realizes, what does that mean? What does it mean? And uh, so I put rocks in that ammo box. And that was one of the first pieces I did. I actually did that, and, uh, that and it was exhibited in a museum in uh, Houston, Texas, the Station Museum. I made a box. I, I took the uh, ammo box that I bought that was only about uh, uh, 12 inches by 12 inches by 4 inches wide. Uh, filled with uh, the 25 caliber or whatever caliber that uh, would be placed in there. I, I, took, I took the uh, ammo box and uh, I realized that it would be a great, great visual to show how the Palestinians are trying, desperately trying, to solve themselves, to solve this issue of being occupied, uh, to be free. Uh, to live like I live here in America. And uh, uh, they're using rocks. They're either th throwing them, using them in a slingshot, but this, this is against very sophisticated military equipment. The imbalance that one sees uh, very quickly when you visit, when you, if you had an opportunity to visit and see what's actually happening, there's a total imbalance. And not only that, the world, is, well, especially where I live in America, we're not, be, we're not being told. The story is not being told. Only part of the story is being told. My father was an amazing person. Um, we lived, we had our own home in uh, Bloomfield, New Jersey. I had a lot of friends that would come to my home, and I recall my father getting up off his chair that he loved to sit on and walking to the front door, opening the front door, and he knew who was coming. I told him I'm expecting visitors, and he would put out his hand and shake the hand of a friend of mine. and escort them into the living room. And I was told by many of my friends that never knew that my dad was blind. My dad never complained about the fact that he didn't have sight. I remember when I was living, uh, I was probably in the fourth or fifth grade, and uh, he had just had surgery at a hospital, an eye and ear hospital. And uh, he came home with bandages over his eyes. And uh, 
The family was told at some point uh, they could remove the bandages. When they did, my dad did, still did not have sight. The operations were pretty much a failure. The medical field didn't know that much about glaucoma, which I think he had, which I don't think they understood that he had. And he had cataract, which today is a, a rather minor surgery. My dad lived as a blind person uh, all his life, uh, the greater part of his life. I never heard my dad complain once. The only things he would ask me to do uh, would help do something physical that he couldn't do. Or he would ask me to go for a walk with him, and we would walk around the block. But as I said, he never complained to me, never complained. But he was listening, he was always listening, or frequently I found him listening uh, to the radio. We had a radio called the Stromberg Culture. It was a floor model radio, had short wave. And I recall frequently my dad would be sitting by the radio, his head tilted toward the, uh, the speaker on the radio, big floor model radio. He would, I recall it, he was about 94, listening, as he usually did, hoping to hear some news about peace in the Middle East. My father lived till 95 and uh, was never able to hear the kind of news that he was hoping for. Peace in the Middle East. At the time when I took a picture of him, and it was a, uh, it's in my book, that I was interviewed by a correspondent who happened to be Jewish. And uh, he was uh, interviewing me uh, on a subject of a, uh, a situation that was occurring in, um, in Westchester. Um, we were trying to have an exhibit. We developed uh, a program in a gallery, an exhibit in a gallery uh, of Palestinian art. Uh, done by artists in Palestine and Palestinian artists in America. And uh, we needed about $100,000 to rent the gallery. It was very expensive. So in the town of Westchester, we uh, were given a, uh, a, uh, a community center where we could sell olive oil. We could sell the Hand of beautiful hand embroidery work that were done by Palestinians. There were a number of people that complained about this. They said that we were selling items to promote a, a show that was a show that was uh, promoting terrorism. The the councilmen in Westchester got involved. Uh, they were called in to see if they could stop. He could stop this. Uh, raising of money for this terrorist show. Well, um, I'm driving to a meeting uh, that I had to be at, and I got a call while I was in the car. I pulled over and uh, answered the call, and it was a gentleman by the name of Peter Applebaum. He, was a, he introduced himself as a writer for the New York Times. And he asked me a lot of questions. And he said he was doing a story about the situation of a group of people raising money for a, a, uh, a show that was promoting terrorism in the Middle East. And uh, he said, could he talk to me about it? I said, certainly. And uh, we talked for about 20 minutes or more. And uh, he published an article. And the article in the New York Times was titled, Much to Do About Nothing. Mm -hmm. Much to Do About Nothing. I was totally, I, I just, I was, 
I was just so pleased with this article that he wrote. And the, uh, the writer, his name, as I said, I, his name is Peter Applebaum. He was a Jewish writer. And in the article that he wrote, the last thing, the last paragraph in the article uh, was a quote from uh, our interview. And, and it went like, if I can remember correctly, I said to him, Peter, my dad died at 94, blind, sitting next to the radio, blind, hoping to hear some good news about peace in the Middle East. I said, P Peter, I'm 71. At the time, I believe I was 71. I'm 71. I, I don't want to die hoping to hear good news about peace in the Middle East. I don't want to wait that long. I don't want to be gone from this world, planet. Well, the way Peter Applebaum ended his article was just that, saying, in the article it ended with, Peter, my dad died a blind, sitting next to the radio, hoping to hear something good about peace in the Middle East. I'm 72 now, and I don't want to die, still hoping to hear some good news about peace in the Middle East. to catch your breath. Thank you. Um, now uh, we will uh, see a short uh, review, about five minutes, of uh, Raji's artwork. Uh, we're going to show you about 145 uh, pieces of art that Raji did.
Uh, the last video we are going to see is about a, a six and a half minute video uh, that Raji Cook had um, produced. Uh, it, it's about the Gaza children and it's titled um, A Child's View from Gaza.
And uh, we're back uh, and our formal program uh, is complete. Uh, just a, a few uh, additional remarks. The, the last uh, video you saw that was uh, produced by Raju Cook um, shows uh, children's drawings. These drawings that, are, that you saw in the video <coughs> are uh, on exhibit at the Palestine Museum US in Connecticut. And it's the only museum in the United States that was actually able to exhibit those uh, drawings. Uh, every other museum and every other venue that attempted to exhibit them was shut down under pressure by uh, pro-Israel groups. Uh, there's also a book available that has all those drawings. Uh, the book is available through the museum's uh, online web uh, bookstore as well. Uh, somebody asked about, asked us to talk about the, the, the museum logo. Uh, it's uh, this logo here that you see on my shirt. Uh, and you, we, you see it also, sorry, uh, right there uh, in the bottom uh, of the photo behind me. And also there's another logo called Palestine Art Week. Uh, both of those logos were designed by Raji. Um, the museum logo has been in use for uh, about three years. Um, great design. So um, if you uh, have not put your name uh, in the QA uh, for uh, to speak, please uh, do that now. And uh, please put any comments or words of sympathy to the family in the chat. Uh, so uh, we have Najat al Khairi uh, who wanted to speak. Uh, everybody who is speaking, please uh, limit your uh, talk to about two minutes or so, as we may have some more people who want to speak. And uh, we're a little bit uh, pressed for time. Okay. Uh, first of all, I uh, my condolences to the family uh, of Raji and all the Palestinian artists in uh, in, in, the, in the whole world. And I just wanted uh, to say that uh, I had the privilege of uh, having an exhibition at the Jerusalem Fund in 2009 uh, uh, entitled Conversation with Gaza. And uh, I really heard uh, through uh, uh, Raji his uh, stories about his name and he was a, a charming person. So I had an, ex uh, an exhibition with him and it was, it was an honor for me also. And uh, this was uh, really, uh, we have a mutual, of course, uh, message, uh, which is uh, giving uh, uh, voice to the voiceless and uh, having uh, uh, our uh, uh, voices heard through art. And uh, a tribute to him really, it was, excellent what we saw now and I am really glad to have this opportunity to talk uh, uh, and uh, and uh, just uh, say uh, how how big impact he did on on uh, the Palestinian people and uh, God bless his soul thank you so much for this time thank you Najat uh, next uh, we will hear from uh, Samia Halabi Samia hi uh, thank you uh, thanks all for presenting this hour. It is very precious and valuable. All the information you presented, uh, we're grateful. Uh, condolences to the family. I first met Raji, heard, first heard about Raji about 20 years ago from my friend Anaya Bushna, who, who subsequently sent me a, 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 a little portfolio of his work and shortly thereafter, uh, he and his brother came to visit me. It was the first time I met Raji. And from there, we developed a friendship and a mutual visiting. And Raji called me uh, on a semi-regular basis. And it was delightful to hear his discussion, uh, to in, in involve him in some of the activities of the Palestinian artists. I know one of the most wonderful events we collaborated on together was made in Palestine exhibition in Texas under the uh, direction of the uh, wonderful museum, the station museum there. Uh, and uh, one of the things that troubled Raji often in our telephone conversations was how to deal with the different 
uh, formations and ideas and arguments that would be presented to him by lovers of Israel and he's trying to defend Palestine and the Palestinian children and how to deal with their arguments, their accusations, uh, essentially with their brainwashed brain uh, and the kind of uh, formulations they would come up with. And Raji and I would discuss how to deal with that, how to analyze it, how to see through the smokescreen of ideas that would be presented and thrown at us, the accusations, the language of uh, racism that would be presented. So he created an incredibly powerful artwork uh, comes straight from his pain and his heart and his love. Uh, I can only wish that he were with us for another 10 years so we could have a little bit more of him. So it's uh, nice to have this opportunity to say goodbye to Raji. Thank you. Thank you, Samia. Uh, we've had uh, some questions uh, from uh, the audience uh, wondering uh, if there's an opportunity to uh, exhibit uh, some of Raji's work uh, in other locations uh, uh, and uh, different parts of the country, other venues. And uh, uh, I will leave that up to the family. Uh, the Palestine Museum US uh, stand ready to participate any exhibition and, and organize any exhibition that the family would like to see. And also we stand ready to uh, house uh, and exhibit and store uh, uh, forever uh, Raji's collection of art as well. Uh, the questions about uh, seeing uh, Raji's video and a recording of this program, uh, those will be on the Palestine Museum uh, website starting tomorrow. Um, and uh, we are happy to uh, to share the videos with you. Uh, uh, we have the video on YouTube, although it's not uh, available to the public at this point. Uh, we will be making it available through the, the website. Um, any member of the family would like uh, to, uh, to speak or say anything, uh, please let us know. Uh, anybody else would like to, to talk? Zena, sorry, uh, I have you on the list here. <laughs> Can you unmute yourself? Hello, Hello yeah. everyone. Hi, Faisal. We, we, we're not hearing you. Uh, uh, try, okay. try again. Uh, okay. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Go ahead, try. Okay. Hello, Faisal. Hello, everyone. I hope it's a clear connection, relatively. Uh, can I, am it's I still not, heard? It's, it's, it's not working. Uh, why don't we tur turn your video off? Maybe that will give more bandwidth to the audio so we can hear okay. it. Okay. Um, I was just, uh, saying that my deepest condolences go to the family, uh, Raji's family. It was very moving to see his interview uh, and see him speak after so long. Uh, we haven't seen him in a long time, but uh, of course, our, our memories of him and what he's done uh, will always remain with us and, uh, and resonate with us. Um, and um, He's visited our, our home on, on numerous occasions, of course, being to ha have him into Jordan uh, with uh, various uh, fact-finding missions that he organized. Uh, we also organized a symposium that he attended about uh, of design and, and art, and um, he presented his work and spoke. And I wanted to show the uh, the pin, but obviously my video is off, so I can't show the pins. He, uh, I can't show the pins that um, hey, you can start your that video he gave again. us, you, you but could... uh, one of you can start it again. Start your video one more time. See if, see how it goes. Okay. See if it works. Um, 
Yeah, it's not it's not working from my end. Well, you need to turn your video on. That's what I'm doing, but I'm clicking on it, but it's not working. I think you deactivated it from your end. Um, no, you, you're a panelist. You should be active. I'm asking you to start the video. Let's see if it works. Start there. Yeah, now I think it's going to work. No. Okay. Yeah. Um, Don't worry about yeah, it. Yeah, it's no longer working for some reason. Um, so yeah, okay, I'll just read it. It said uh, a masterpiece, uh, P-E-A-C-E, -E, requires artfulness. That was one of his um, beautiful pins that he gave away to people who attended the symposium. And it was a, it was just lovely to have, to have him. He was such an inspiration to everyone who attended uh, as a designer, a speaker. Um, he was a, a true motivational speaker to everyone he met. Uh, in Jordan and in Palestine, everyone he, he brought to Jordan and he took, they always came back and told their stories to us, what they witnessed with, with Raji, what Raji told them, um, the stories he told them. Um, so it was really uh, something beautiful to see, uh, you know, the tra trail he left behind for people. Um, he, um, again, I can't start the video. I, I also wanted to show you my album because uh, when I was 14, Raji uh, basically helped me record my very first uh, album. Now, I'm a singer, so he took me to his son-in-law's uh, basement studio and got me to record my very first album. And one of the songs he really loved was Nasa Ma'alayna Al-Hawa by Fairuz. And he actually included it in one of the documentaries he did about uh, Palestine. And uh, I just... You can still hear me, right? <laughs> yes. Hello? Yeah, continue, yeah. please. Uh, I just, yeah, I just wanted to do um, a small uh, dedication and song, basically, of Nesta and Hawa, only uh, literally a few seconds, because I know I don't have that, um, that much longer. So uh, this is to, to Raji and his love for Palestine. Take, and, take your time. Uh, we have just, extra time because not enough people wanting to speak. So take your time. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, so yeah, to Raji. <clears throat> من مفرع الوادي يا هوا دخل الهوا خدني على بلادي خدني 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 على بلادي so there <laughs> Wonderful. Well, we need to bring you back for a whole uh, session sometime. You know, uh, I think Raji gave me your sure, phone. Sure, I would love. Raji gave me your phone number about two, three times, and I, I never got around to calling you. So maybe now I'd have to call you. Yes, no, that's <laughs> no, of course, with pleasure. Actually, there's one little tiny bit I'd like to do for him as well, because um, I know he always loved the idea of going back home um, to Palestine. And uh, this is also for Fairuz, and it's called Sanaj Ayaman. I won't do the uh, also a long, um, I'll just do a very small version of it, only the beginning, because it's a very long song. Sanaj Ayaman ila hayna ونغرقوا في دافئات المنى سنرجع مهما يمر الزمان وتن المسافة ما بيننا فقلب مهلا ولا ترتمي على درب عودتنا موهنا فيا قلب مهلا ولا ترتمي على درب عودتنا موهنا يعز علينا غدا أن تعود Wonderful. 
there. So love to Raji and to all of you. <laughs> this is a bit emotional for me, so my uh, my voice is a bit shaky. <laughs> but um, so we're gonna we're gonna have to have the uh, uh, the Raji Cook Memorial Concert. Uh, yes, of course. I would love to be a part of it. Okay, I'm gonna have to look up that phone number that he gave me. Um, yeah, of course. I'll uh, I'll send it to you also via. I, I mean, I've, I we're in touch on Instagram as well, and I'll text it to you. Sure, thank you. I'll I, I send was, you. I, I was kidding, and you. I'm. A, I know how to get hold of you. So. <laughs> Th thank okay, you so great. much. Thank you. Uh, we, we, we weren't we weren't counting on this having beautiful music at the end, you know. So, but uh, thank you so much. It's a great surprise. No, thank you for hosting um, this lovely webinar and um, you know, in memory of Raji. Uh, I mean, I feel like a member of the family, so I'm speaking like a member of the family. Um, and uh, yeah, we miss him dearly, and he, as I said, he left a legacy behind, so he will be always remembered for his love and for his work. Thank you. As 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 everybody who uh, wanted to speak spoken. I noticed that um, Cindy and Will Rodine, um, his his daughter, um, want to say something. Um, they put uh, in a Q and A. I don't know. Give, if give, give, give me a second. I will. I will. Uh, promote them to panelists. Cindy? Yep, C-Y-N-D-I. C-Y-N-D-I. Okay, so and she should pop up on the list here. There we go. Let's see. Uh, yeah, ask Cindy, please uh, unmute yourself. Right here. Oh, wait. Okay, Maybe. we can hear you. Put your video on if you Where's like. Where's the video? Yeah, turn your video on. It's in the bottom left corner. There we go. Yeah, there we are. Okay, Mom. There. Um, we want to thank everyone for doing this. It was it was so beautiful. Um, it was it was good to see my father actually speak because we haven't really heard him speak like that for a while, and it was good to see that. And it was just so lovely. Everybody's tributes and the the everything you've done has been wonderful. And we want to thank you so much. It means a lot, and my mom is here, and it, it was—it's a really good thing for her to hear. I want to say thank you also. At this point, I—I I can't really say too much. It's okay, mom. But I, right. uh, it was wonderful seeing all of the information that Roger was talking about. I've heard heard him talk like that, and to hear him say it again. Uh, it's been a while since we heard him speak. Yeah, it's been a while since we've heard him speak uh, with his, uh, before he passed away. With and, passion. Uh, it was so nice to see that there were so many people that were, uh, I'm having a lot of trouble here it's right okay, now. It's okay, Mom. It's all right. It was Dana, you were beautiful. And sorry we couldn't see much of you. I saw Amal there. Yes, um, I did too. I'm so sorry we haven't seen each other in so long. And do Sally, miss you. Sally, we miss you. <laughs> yeah, our new little great grand baby. Uh, I wish you could all come over and visit with us. Uh, we would love to. Thank you so much. Thank you. Peggy, I just want to let you know that when I was talking with Raji and at the end, he says, did I do well? I said, <laughs> oh, my, my God, did you do well? What a what an interview. I know. It was him. It was truly Roger. <laughs> anyway, thank you. Thank you so much. for putting this together. Yeah, thank it's you. Thank everyone you. who attended. Thank you for allowing us to share your uh, your grief with you. Oh, I hope it was all... a tribute that we could not have. That was it. Was just a beautiful tribute. Thank you so much. I, it's amazing. And then the video will be available tomorrow, so you can uh, share it with people. And I, I will uh, send you uh, the uh, the links and all the information you need. Okay, That's fantastic.
uh, th that that video <laughs> was recorded on an I was recorded on an iPhone, by the way. Oh yes, Dana. Just want to say a few words. Peggy, hi, family, hello, everyone. It's Amal. Oh, Amal. Uh, too bad the video is not working, but we see you. We can see you all, and uh, it really, it really, we miss you. And I really, really treasure all of you. And he's he's going to money. We will miss him a lot. Thank and you so I much. miss you all and our deep condolences. You know that we love you so much. Oh, and, uh, I can't tell you how much. Uh, I, I know it's you. a very tough time. Yeah. Uh, when I get to the point where I can talk about it, I'll, I'll, I hope we can get in touch with each, with each other then. Right now, I, I'm just being a, I don't know, I can't. Oh, okay. Okay. <sighs> Thank Sorry. you again. Yeah. Okay, Piggy. Okay. Okay, dear. Okay, we'll talk. we we'll speak to you some uh, time next week, hopefully. Thank you. Oh, and bye, everyone. Bye. Sorry that the video is not working clearly. We can hear you. Thank um, you. Uh, I would like to thank uh, everyone who joined us today, and uh, um, yeah, and largely. Thank you. It was great, Peggy. Thank you so much for appearing. Oh. It's really appreciated. Oh. Uh, uh, it'll take a I long can't, time. I can't thank you enough. I really, it's, it's, oh, anyway. Peggy, uh, I remember my wife and I came to visit you uh, on a Sunday morning. We got there too early and you made us coffee and you shared your uh, pastry with us, the ones you, uh, you made. I, I remember. I do remember. I still remember, and I remember that. our visits up to the, up to the uh, museum. And, and oh. I haven't been up there in so long. I hope to be getting up again. Uh, inshallah, inshallah. With family here. And we'll definitely see you again, I hope. Inshallah. We will. We will. <laughs> And thank you for bringing Roger back to me for a while. <laughs> I'm sorry. That video is, is very precious. And uh, I worked on it about 20 hours to, to produce it and uh, every minute was worth it. Thank you. Oh, I saw. Yes. Yeah, and I just want to say to all his friends and his family, thank you for allowing us to share him with the world today. Like a fitting tribute. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, Nancy. Okay, okay. Uh, I think we uh, are going to wrap this up. Thanks, everybody. Uh, I know this is a very emotional experience for all of us, and uh, we need a little bit of time to. Uh, wind down and relax. I hope uh, everyone would do that. Uh, it was beautiful. Thank you. It was it, just beautiful. It was. Thank you all. God thank bless you. his soul. Take care, thank everybody. You, Faisal, for doing thank this. You. Thank you did you, a great Faisal. job. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Faisal. <laughs> thank you. Our, our, our job is to tell the Palestinian story through the arts, and by God, we did it today. I think you did. I can't believe it. It's beautiful. Yeah. Thank you. Take care, everyone. Thanks. We're going to have to say goodbye. Uh, we say it in Arabic usually. Ma'asalam, everyone. Ma'asalam. Allah